Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles, would you please open them to two places, Joshua chapter 4 and 1 Samuel chapter 7. Joshua chapter 4 and 1 Samuel chapter 7 in a Bible study that I've entitled, Thus Far the Lord Has Helped Us. Thus Far the Lord Has Helped Us. It's taken right from the text in 1 Samuel chapter 7. And even though it's just a number or the turning of a calendar page, a new year is always encouraging to me personally as I begin to think of new beginnings, as I begin to think of new opportunities. Now, of course, the enemy would not want me to look forward. The enemy would want me to look backwards, would want me to be swallowed in regret, would want me to be swallowed in anger and frustration. And even as we look to this past year, 2020, for sure, has been a horrific year in so many different ways. However, it's been a year allowed by God. He's not surprised by it. He's using it. He used it. And he hasn't abandoned us. But rather, God is with us in these last days. And I came across this phrase that's so important. I thought it was so cool. I wanted to jot it down for you. It's his past faithfulness demands our present trust. And as we look back upon the year, we see the faithfulness of God. Listen, 2020 will not be the end of your trials and your problems and your tribulations. They will continue on until the coming of the Lord. And what God is reminding us of is that what our need is, is for endurance. So that we bear up under the load and the weight of how things are becoming increasingly more difficult. Not just in things outside of our control, but it was also in our, in our families and the situations of our bodies and our minds and the things that are sur- surrounding us. In Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36, it says, you have need of endurance. And that's just a word from the Lord. So that after you have done the will of God, you will receive the promise. For all of us as believers, there's always that danger to forget the faithfulness of God to forget his goodness, especially when times get tough. Like in 2020, what a year it's been. It could be very easy to look back and see the difficulties, see the pains, see the hardships, see the changes, and because of that, begin to identify by the scars of 2020, and many of them are being carried right in to 2021. And throughout the Bible, throughout the Bible, God tells us not to forget. Don't forget. Don't forget my faithfulness. Don't forget my goodness. Don't forget all that I've done, all that I'm doing. The Greek word for forget in the Bible literally means to fail to hold in our minds. I like that phrase, hold. The idea of forgetting is we let go of the memories of God's faithfulness. We let go of the truths of God's goodness because we're overcome by our present difficulty and our present situation. And forgetting is so easy. So at least two times, and really three times, in the scriptures, God uses rocks or stones as a way to remember his faithfulness. The first one's right here in Joshua chapter 4. The children of Israel are coming in, and they have crossed the Jordan River. They've come out of Egypt. A generation has died in the wilderness. Joshua has taken over and he leads the nation right up to the Jordan. The Jordan is overflowing. It's impassable and impossible at the same time. And notice in verse 1 of chapter 4, And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men, from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm. You shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men 
whom he appointed from the children of Israel, one man from every tribe. And Joshua said to them, cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this, verse 6, may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? You shall answer them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. So God is using Joshua as the human leader, the man that he's appointed to lead the nation into the promises of God, into the promised land. But please Don't lose sight of, although God was using a human leader to direct with humans, God was in control of all the activities. God was in control of all the activities at the Jordan River that day. He told the priest when when to enter into the river, and when to leave, when to go to the other side. He told the water to roll back and when to come and return. And both the water and the people obeyed him, and everything worked out just as God had planned. And so now we see that God says, look, I don't want you to forget this momentous occasion. I don't want you to forget throughout all generations. I want you to remember my faithfulness and my deliverance and my ability to get you through the impossible. And the way that you're going to do that is you're going to grab some stones and you're going to stack them up. Actually, in the chapter, we learned that there were two stacks of stones One in Gilgal, and the other is going to be in the midst of the river. And these stones, even as you have one sitting in your lap or next to you, these stones would become a memory, a memorial stone, so that every time they would see them, they would remember the power, presence, and faithfulness of God. And we need to set things up in our lives that we will not forget the faithfulness of God that there will be witnesses to the truth that God honors faith and God works on behalf of those who trust in him. Now, God knows that we have a tendency to forget. God knows that we have a tendency to let go in our minds the memories of his glorious works that he's accomplished in our past. We are many times people of the moment as we allow our minds to be caught up in whatever's in front of us. And I'm amazed, personally, how people can forget the wonderful things that God has done for them. I'm amazed of that capacity in my own life, where many times the spiritual warfare that's ongoing in my life, and most likely yours, is in the mind. Where will you think? What will you think about? What will you meditate on? And I'm amazed. I know people that have seen marvelous things done by God, miracles God has worked in their lives, and in their families, and in their health. Like, for example, you know, there are many people, your born-again experience, one of the, the, the greatest miracle that's ever happened in your life. But over the years, it's not so miraculous anymore because you're caught up now with present-day concerns and present-day issues. And God is always reminding, remember, remember he told the church in Ephesus, remember from where you have fallen. Remember, remember, remember. So vital that we remember. And one of the reasons, a second reason, I should say, why we have memorial stones is notice verse 6. So this might be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, what do these stones mean to you? God was very interested of his greatness being passed down to each generation. And he was very interested in the parents answering their kids' questions. And I know it might be odd. Uh, Even last night, uh, one of the kids was here as I was greeting before service, and and his family had a rock, and he said, what are these rocks for, pastor? And I explained to him that he can ask his dad after the service, because by the time we're done, his dad is going to have the answer to answer his son. Why do we have these rocks? As you you find that, man, it's just kind of a weird thing. Why would we do that? And why are they passing these out? One of the reasons is to remember the faithfulness of God. Another reason is so that you can tell generation after generation after generation of the faithfulness of God. 
So with it sitting there, you got your house nicely, immaculately uh, decorated, everything's in there, and then there's that dirty, ugly rock right in the middle of everything. And you know, someone's going to come in and go, what's up with the rocks? Why the rock? And an open door is there going to be before you to say, I'm going to tell you about that rock. It, it is a, a memorial stone. It brings back memories of a particular time where God showed himself faithful, where he miraculously opened up a way when there was no way, where he ministered to my anxiety, to my fears, to my desire to go backwards, but he brought me forward. In this particular rock that I brought, um, this one I wrote on it, and that's what I want you guys to do before you leave. You can do it here before you leave or you can do it at home, but we put Sharpies out for you if you want to use them on the way out. I wrote, this is a rock from 2014 of a trip that I took to St. Cloud, Minnesota. This was the year after my son passed away. It was a very difficult year for us, probably the most difficult year uh, in 2014. And I was invited out to do some leadership development with the Calvary Chapel there. And it went great and it went wonderful, but I went out to, to give and what God had an appointment for me that he had something to give to me. And I, when I see this, it's in my office at home. I brought these in from home. I have it displayed there. So when I walk in my office and it catches my eye, I'm reminded of the faithfulness of God. I'm not just buried under the weight of everything. It catches my eye and I go, ah, oh, I remember that time. And it even evokes memories. I remember visually where we were walking through this creek and walking into the hills and through the trees. And I remember the mosquitoes. Oh, were they mosquitoes? Oh, there was lots of mosquitoes there. And I remember it because then I remember God's faithfulness. And we're setting things up in our lives so that we can talk about God's faithfulness. Notice back in Joshua chapter 4, it says, The children of Israel, verse 8, did so, just as Joshua commanded. And they took up the 12 stones from the midst of the Jordan. And the Lord had spoken to Joshua according to the numbers of the tribes of the children of Israel, carried them over to the place where they had lodged and laid them there. In verse 9, Joshua set up 12 other stones in the midst of the Jordan. One of the things, another reason I think that stones, we have these memorial stones is this. When you want to go backwards, you will have to pass the stones of remembrance. Like if they wanted to go back across the Jordan, obviously they could cross at different places, but they would have in their memory somewhere in the rock area, somewhere in the, the riverbed here is a stack of stones speaking of the faithfulness of God. And as you stack these stones up in your life, physically or spiritually, you know, symbolically, if you want to retreat and go backwards, you have to pass the stones of remembrance. If you want to run away, and you want to be done with it. Christianity is not working out the way you thought it would. 2020 was a horrible year. It, and now I have more warfare in my life than I've ever had before. I've got more family issues. I've got more issues in what I do for a living. I've got more finance. And I, you know, I'm done with it. And as you walk past, you've got to walk past the memorial stones. You, you've got to go, wait a minute. If I go backwards and I'm stepping over God's faithfulness. Like if God was faithful in the past then his faithfulness demands present trust that God hasn't changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so Joshua took the stones with him. He stacked them in the city. He had the elders stack them, but he also put them in the river so that you have God's faithfulness with you. And then if you want to go back, you're going to have to pass through the faithfulness of God. Now, let's turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 7. This is a transition time again, once again, in the life of the children of Israel. And I just find 2020 has a transition time. Things are changing, and they're changing rapidly, very dramatically, extremely difficult, hard for us to understand. Even practical things we don't like, and we don't like some of the governmental decisions, and we don't like some of the restrictions, and we don't like, it's just it, layer after layer, as we've seen in previous studies, it's just unbelievable. Well, this is a transition time in the life of the children of Israel as well. And they're getting to a place where they've just lived after all these years of judges, and Samuel is the last judge. And the people are tired of judges, man. They, they want a king. That's what they want. they want. They want what they want. And that has been a big battle for many believers, many people in our culture. They just want what they want. And I wonder how much that's affected you where you respond to all these difficulties and the final word is, I just want what I want. 
I don't want to deal with this anymore. And I don't want these decisions. I just want what I want. Well, that's where the children of Israel are. And God has sent them a man, a messenger with a message. And notice with me in verse 1 of 1 Samuel chapter 7, the Bible says, Then the men of Kirjath-Jerim came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it into the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eleazar his son to keep the ark of the Lord. So it was that the ark remained in Kirjath-Jerim a long time. It was there 20 years. And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Then Samuel, verse 3, spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord. Serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and served the Lord only. Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpah. And I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now, verse 7, when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. So the children of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So it was years earlier that the Philistines defeated the children of Israel and stole the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was that place where God's presence came on the mercy seat. And although it was simply a box, it was a box dedicated to the worship of God where God would meet the people on the mercy seat. They finally got it back. And it's lodging there in Eleazar's, his son's house, in Eleazar's house. But here understand that having the ark in Jewish hands, now that they have it back, doesn't automatically solve all of Israel's problems. Because Israel's problems was a heart issue. And church, it's important that you remember. Let's just say 2021 gives you what you want. Let's just say all your heart's desires are fulfilled. That's not going to solve all your problems. Because the problems in your life and mine are a matter of the heart. That's why he calls them. He says, you know what? You need to come back with your hearts. That's what he says in verse 3. If you return to the Lord with all your heart, the heart representing the seed of your emotions. You know, when you are committed to something, you put your whole, we even use that phrase, you put your whole heart into it. You're fully committed. And change requires a commitment of the heart, not just the mind. The, the goal of God is always to get to the heart of the matter. And when you look back at 2020 and maybe some of the things that have frustrated you, some of the things that, have, that, that you've dealt with, you've also got to ask the question, God, what have you revealed to me in my heart? What have you shown me? You know, for the children of Israel, you know what they needed to have revealed? They needed two things revealed to them. Number one, they were very idolatrous. They at this one point, at the same time they were calling upon the name of the Lord, they were also worshiping idols and cooperating in the world around them. Don't think for a moment that that isn't happening in your life or mine. Where you at one point, or at the same time you call upon God, and at the very same time you're calling upon God, you're involved in idolatry. Not just little statues, you know, so you go home and maybe look at, what well, I don't have a statue here, I don't have a statue here. Idolatry is always a matter of the heart. Divided loyalties. So change required them to deal with the issue that was soiling their heart. And for them, it was idolatry, but it was also apathy. There wasn't a strong worship of God. They needed to put away their false gods and get back to serving God. And that's what we see here at Mizpah. There's a cleansing going on. Put away the foreign gods. Put away the gods that you are trusting in. And serve the Lord. And they did. And they're, they're willing. It says in verse 6, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel began to judge the children of Israel. But notice verse 7. 
When the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered, they went up against Israel. And you just need to realize that these these steps of dealing with the issues in your life are going to bring more resistance. The enemy will not be happy, whether it's an enemy that's human, physical, whether it's a spiritual enemy in the mind, maybe it's an old habit, an addiction that shows up, and there you are making progress. This is going to be the year. I'm going to step in. I want God to take more of me. I'm ready. I learned my lessons, or I'm learning my lessons from 2020. And there the Philistines heard about it and right away said, no, no, no progress for you. No way. We're going to destroy you. We, we liked it better when you were idolatrous. The world liked it better when the church just kind of, well, you know, it's not that big a deal. We're not going to take our relationship with God very seriously. And then when you start taking it seriously, all hell breaks loose. And this nation was dealing with attacks on every side. However, notice in verse 9, Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it as a burnt offering to the Lord. The response to opposition was worship. I don't know about you. I'm sure we all share this in common. I mean, most of us share this in common. But something special happens when we sing songs to God. It's something inside. Like you can sing songs that you grew up with. You can sing songs of the Beatles. You can sing songs of... that. They don't have the same effect at all of songs that you sing in worship of God. A song that you offer. And as you offer it, God meets you and he responds. And there's fellowship. When you sing songs of worship, there's fellowship. It immediately puts you in a position of protection, of abiding when you sing songs. And even if you come in, as I certainly have on occasion, and I don't really feel like singing. I don't really want. There's sometimes there'll be a song up there and and there'll be the lyrics and I'm like, I'm not saying that. You know, you're singing, oh, break me, crush me, take me out. Lord, no. No, Ian, pick another song. How about this? Love me, hug me, take care of me. How about that song? And yet, as I'm sitting there wrestling in my own mind, I'm listening to other people singing those lyrics. (laughs) I'm like, yes, Lord, that's good for them. Break them, crush them. No, not really, no. (laughs) Ministers to my heart. That there is a sense of worship and adoration of God. And of course, it's not reserved for the few minutes that we have a worship leader leading us. God has intended us to have a lifestyle of worship of the heart. Not just for the few minutes that we gather together, but for our lives. And I love this. The answer to the Philistines, to the enemies of God, was worship and sacrifice. And so notice Samuel cried out to the Lord, verse 9, for Israel, and the Lord answered him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, notice the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. And the men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as beth Car. So here you are, you're in a place of resist people coming against you, situations against you. You come to worship and then it gets worse. So now they come in battle array and they're ready to take you on. And you're like, I don't know what's going to happen. And God shows up miraculously moment by moment. The enemy pursues, but victory belongs to the Lord. And as you know, 1 Samuel, we went through it verse by verse not too long ago, a few years ago, and you remember in studying 1 Samuel and in your Bible reading, if you're going through the Bible again, you'll get to it in a few months, that it was at Ebenezer 20 years earlier that the Philistines actually defeated the children of Israel and 30,000 were lost. But now it's in that same place of defeat 20 years later that God gives great victory. What makes the difference between the two times? Well, the first time, when they went out earlier 20 years, they were defeated because they didn't seek the Lord. And they were soundly defeated. They went out without seeking the guidance of God, without seeking the help of God. As our Proverbs today, Proverbs chapter 3, will tell you, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all your ways. And what? He will direct your paths. 
Well, the first time 20 years ago, they didn't do that. And they were soundly defeated, completely defeated. Now, here in chapter 7, with the leadership of Samuel, they go out relying upon God, trusting him. Were they fearful? They were fearful. The Bible says so. It says in verse 7, they were afraid of the Philistines because they knew their strength was weak. But they were trusting in God and they went with prayer and worship and sacrifice and God delivers the enemy into their hands. And how many times, church, how many times as we're struggling against the flesh and the enemy do we seek to go out in our own strength? How many times do we just run out as if we've got it all figured out, only to find ourselves defeated and wiped out, sometimes completely? I don't have the power, personally, to resist every temptation in life. I need the power of God residing in me, trusting Him toward every temptation in life. I need the strength of God. I need the help of God. We have to rely upon God if we're going to be victorious moment by moment. And so the vast difference between defeat and victory is acknowledging God, acknowledging him in your life. And the work of God should always lead to the worship of God, as we see here in their lives. Then notice what happens. It says in verse 12, then Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shen and called its name Ebenezer. And those of you that can see that, you can mark that word. It means stone of help. This was a stone to be reminding of the help of God. Ebenezer, and then he he set it up and he said, thus far the Lord has helped us. And we can as well raise our Ebenezer stones in our own lives and look at where we are today and say in this moment, thus far the Lord has helped us. God has brought me this far. And the encouraging thing about this to me is that God has not brought me this far. Listen, God has not brought you this far just to drop you. I go, well, this is the end of the line, folks. I got you through six things. I got you through five things. And here you are. I'm dropping you like a rock. I wasn't sure what that would do, but that's what it did. A lot of times people relate to God and thinking, you know, that's what God does. He just drops me like a rock. But that's not the symbolism of the rock of Ebenezer, this stone of remembrance. Ebenezer is the stone that helps. It's the stone where God showed up and helped them, defeated the enemy, strengthened them, showed up where in that same place of defeat, you know, because oftentimes that's exactly what God will do. God will bring you to the place of a previous defeat and show you victory, give you another chance, the God of the second chance. And he'll show you his victory and he'll show you his strength. God has brought me this far. He's going to take me all the way. We're going to stand before the presence of God at the Bema seat of Christ and we will worship him and spirit and in truth and we will say we'll look back and go man God you have been faithful to me he will in in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 it says being confident of this very thing he who's begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ Psalm 138 8 the Lord will perfect that which concerns me Jude 124 Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. And he is doing that now as we have the chance to consider this year and say, well, Lord, I'm not going to let you define this. I'm not going to let 2020 define what my life is, as hard as it might have been. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to find a place of faithfulness in this previous year. It wasn't hard for me to find many places of God's faithfulness. It certainly was one of the most, I wouldn't say it was the most, but it certainly in my life was one of the most difficult years I've experienced because this whole thing has affected every part of my life personally. Not only that, but in the life that I live and the role that God has put me in the body, on top of all the restrictions and difficulties were all the division among the church that, I mean, there's always been little skirmishes 
But this year was, no, this past year was just unbelievable, the kind of division among believers, among churches, how many pastors quit because of the, because of the difficulty in the church, because of, like, it's just, it's been challenging. However, man, 2020 was a good year because God was faithful through it all. And you're going to be able to say that. You might not be able to say that now, but God is faithful. And we can't forget his faithfulness. You know, there's another place, we're not going to develop it here, but there's another place in the scriptures where rocks were used to show forth the strength of God. I actually have a bag of rocks here that I brought in. They're normally not in a bag, but I brought them in a bag from my office. On one side of my office, I have some some memorial stones like this one. And then on the other side, uh, I have these little rocks. These little rocks uh, are from Israel. And one of the stops that we take when we do a tour in Israel is we take you toward the end of the trip into the Valley of Elah. And there's two hills on either side. You can see it. We come in. We take you into a creek bed that's just laden with little rocks like these, little stones. And there we have a time of worship, uh, singing right there in the creek bed in the Valley of Elah. And then we have a little devotional. And then that devotional, we talk about um, the great battle that took place in the Valley of Elah, the battle between David and Goliath. And we talk about God's faithfulness and the giants, usually whoever has that assignment almost always has the same theme because you're just standing there thinking about the victory of God. And then at the end, uh, we say at the end of that time, we give some time to walk around and be alone with the Lord. And and I tell them, uh, I tell everyone on the trip, I say, go ahead and pick up a rock or two. And you know, if you're a Sunday school teacher, you could take a bag full uh, and bring them back for the kids. Uh, and, but for yourself, I want you to take two rocks, one for you to take home as a memory, and the other one I want you to find a place that's safe, and I want you to, like David, sling that rock at the giant in your life. And so I've got a bag of them here that I've written down every year, because I have, at least since 2014, uh, I have in this bag the reality of the same giant that I still face today, that always loves to rear its ugly head, and I have these as remembrance in each one. So when the giant falls, I'm going to be able to lay out these rocks and say that every year I prayed, and every year I was there, and every year I took my stones, uh, and I threw one, and I kept one every year. It'll be able to lay out. I hope there's not, I hope I don't fill the bag, but even if I do fill the bag, even if it takes forever for that to be fulfilled, I believe God will fulfill it. And I stand by, I stand in faith, trusting God, even when I don't see what God is doing. And so whether it's a large stone like this or little stones like that, God, or ones like in Joshua, we didn't give you ones that you put on your shoulders and carry out. Those must have been big. But the reality of, the reality of this is that as you look back, I want you to be able to say, I know it was a hard year. I know it was difficult. But I'm going to, as the song instructs me, I'm going to raise my Ebenezer stone and I'm going to declare that God is the God of help. And he helps me in all my tribulations and comforts me and strengthens me. And because he's brought me thus far, he's going to take me all the way. He hasn't brought you this far just to say that's the end. And so we're able to raise this stone in a few moments and we'll be able to say, all right, God has brought me this far. We bless God. He has helped me. And whenever you're discouraged, put the stone in a prominent place and look at it when you're discouraged, when you're depressed, whenever the enemy begins to overwhelm you and the temptations begin to overpower you. You look back at your Ebenezer stone and you say, oh, thus far God has brought me and he's still with me today. What a glorious confidence we have when we realize the work that God has done. And I want to end in this scripture. Would you turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 as Pastor Ian comes back. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I want you to read this with me. It's so encouraging because Paul came to a place in his life where he was done. And he gives us an episode of all the things he experienced. He tells the Corinthians of an episode in his life. Notice in verse 8 of chapter 1, 2 Corinthians. He says, For I don't want you guys to be ignorant of the trouble which came to us in Asia. For we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, 
that, and here's the key, if you don't have this highlighted or underlined, you need to underline this. This is the work of God right now. This is how he's using your present circumstance. This is what he's wanting you to learn so that you should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead. Could it be that some of the difficulties and challenges are made more challenging and more difficult because you refuse to trust in the Lord and you just keep trusting in yourself? And you just keep trusting in your resources. And you keep trusting in whatever it is that you're holding on to. And God says, no, I've allowed 2020 into your life so you would learn. Stop trusting in yourself, but trust in me who raises the dead. Who delivered us, notice, from such a great death and does deliver us. In whom we trust he will still deliver us. Isn't that great? The power of God delivered us, is delivering us and will deliver us. That's the work, the finished work of God. It's complete. He's helped me in the past, and he's helping me now. In church, the Lord will perfect that which concerns you. That means completed. God is going to complete the work in your life. And to me, that's all I need. I might have to think about it a hundred times a day, but I'm trusting God a hundred times a day. He's working in my life. He's going to complete it. He knew this when I was born again, and he knows it today, almost 30 years later. He knows what I need in order to glorify his name on the earth. So today we leave with confidence, assurance, victory, and a free rock. So I want you guys to get your rock in your hand. Let's stand together. And at the point, I want to give you, let's all stand. We're going to be heading out here in a moment. If you have your rock, I want you to raise it up as high as you can. Because that's, you're just practicing. This is what I want you guys to do when you're told to in the song. And maybe you do it like this, uh, but I want you to raise that. So now you know, every time you see, hear this song, this, this hymn, when it says, raise my Ebenezer, that's what it means. You just learned it for the first time. So Father, we just pray right now that these things would plant seeds of hope in our hearts. I know for some listening and here right now, it's, things are very hard overwhelming, challenging, the sentence of death even. There's great opposition from the enemy. There are people doing things, saying things, writing things, posting things, uh, plotting things. And I just pray for your protection and encouragement of those struggling. And those that are in a great place today, Lord, let their encouragement spread among us. Let their voices speak forth of your faithfulness of the season they're in that is smooth sailing right now. We receive it. We receive a good season. We receive a good time. We receive uh, joy and happiness. We receive it, Lord. We take it. And so good or bad, happy or sad, we all come to you together acknowledging your faithfulness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.